Jazz music is sometimes considered music theory turned into music, mostly by people who don't actually play jazz. And of course, that's not really how you want to look at it. But at the same time, if you're trying to learn jazz, then learning some music theory is something that's really efficient. It's going to help you learn a lot faster. And it's also going to help you get a lot more out of the stuff that you practice and the stuff that you transcribe. At the same time, it's also important that you go about learning music theory in the right way so you don't end up with a weird set of rules that just stop you from using your ears. My name is Jens Larsen, learn jazz, make music. Most of the exercises in this video are the kind of things that you would do if you're just stuck in a bus or a train or waiting in line somewhere. At least that's how I did it most of the time. But of course, since when I was learning this, there were no smartphones, then in the meantime, maybe there are some really useful apps that will help quiz you on these things. So if you use an app, for learning theory like that, feel free to share it in the comments because it's always good to have some different options. Some of the exercises are really mostly about thinking and having an overview of the theory, but at the same time, they actually also really make sense to just go over with your instrument. So just playing all the chords of a song or the diatonic chords and in that way also really getting it into your ears. And I think that's an important point when it comes to music theory. Instead of just trying to learn all music theory, I always found that for me it made a lot more sense to really focus on the things that I could also recognize in the music that I played. Describing a chord as a sharp four double diminished with the seventh in the bass or a German sixth augmented, which is essentially the same thing, that doesn't really tell you how it sounds. At the same time, if you already play Out of Nowhere or Angel Eyes and you really wonder why that flat six dominant sounds good when it resolves back to the one chord, then maybe that explanation makes a lot more sense. And maybe calling it a sharp four double diminished also really describes how the voices move a lot better and really help you understand why it's related to a diminished chord, for instance. And this is something that's very important about music theory. It's there to describe the music. So if you don't know any music where that type of theory is in, then it's probably not that useful for you. Each of the exercises that I go over in this video, I'm going to try to explain or highlight not only what the exercise is, but also what you will learn from it and how it will improve your playing, because that is essentially what you want to do. You want to become a better improviser. You don't want to be a music theory professor. I've often talked about learning the basic material that's in the scales that you already want to use if you improvise. It's going to help you have a better overview of really so many things connecting harmony to the melodies that you want to play and also just the melodies of the songs that you're playing. So it is really important that for any scale you want to use when you're improvising, you also check out the diatonic chords in there. You can probably already do this in most major keys. So first just try to picture the notes of the scale. So if we take E flat major, so E flat, F, G, A flat, B flat, C, D and E flat. Now let's add the chords. So this is of course a major scale, so it's E flat major seven, F minor seven, G minor seven, A flat major seven, B flat seven, C minor seven, D half diminished, and then E flat major seven. And hopefully this is pretty familiar territory for most of you guys, but then how does it go if you have to do the same for A flat harmonic minor? A flat, B flat, C flat, D flat, E flat, F flat, G, and then A flat. And the chords, so A flat minor major, B flat half diminished, C flat major seven sharp five, D flat minor seven, E flat seven, F flat major seven, and then G diminished, and then A flat minor major. Exercises like this are really useful for finding arpeggios that works with the, the different chords that you want to play over. And of course, A flat harmonic minor sounds like that's kind of far out. Also, some of the note choices in there are, of course, not what we're used to seeing. But at the same time, imagining that you have to play over an E flat seven flat nine resolving to A flat major, like you have in All the Things You Are or The Olympian Be Another You, it's not really science fiction. And it's just good to have an overview of what is available and also how they work over the chord. In that way, you can figure out that you can actually use a C flat or B major seven sharp five over an E flat seven flat nine. A variation of this exercise, which is kind of turning it around, but is also really useful, is to start with the chord and then find the scale afterwards. So if we start with a basic D7, so D, F sharp, A and C, 
Then, of course, that's the fifth chord in uh, G major, so... It's also the five in G harmonic minor. And also in G melodic minor. And of course, we also have G harmonic major. But then we also have it as a fourth degree in A melodic minor. And it's also hidden inside B flat harmonic major, where it's sort of not really there because if you just stack the chords in there, you get a D minor, but the G flat can also be used as an F sharp, and then we actually do have a D7, so. So looking at it this way around, then you're really checking out how you know a lot of different scales, and you're also coming up with some different scale choices that you can incorporate into your playing if you want to have some other sounds available on a D7 chord. The next step is to take it a little bit further and then go beyond just the diatonic chords, but also look at what the cadences are for those chords. I used to do this exercise all the time with my roommate when we were just starting out. So we would quiz each other and then name a key and a scale degree. And then the answer that you would have to figure out would be what chord is on that degree in the scale and what is the secondary cadence that leads to that scale degree. Knowing what type of 2-5 or cadence resolves to a chord in a key really helps you understand what's going on in a song, but it also helps you choose the right scale for a secondary 2-5 or a secondary dominant. So if we look at the basics, a B flat major scale would have these diatonic chords. B flat major 7, C minor 7, D minor 7, E flat major 7, F7, G minor 7, A half diminished, and B flat major 7. And you can have a cadence for each of those. So of course, the first degree, that's just a 2 5 one and they're already in the scale. So, so for B flat major 7, that's C minor F7. So C minor, this is a minor chord, so you have a minor cadence to that. So that would be like a D half diminished to a G7 flat 9 to C minor. The same goes for D minor. So here we're getting some chords that are clearly not in the key because we get an E half diminished and an A7. Then E flat major 7. So that's F minor to B flat 7 to E flat. The F7, that's G minor 7, C7 to F7. And then we get G minor, that's A half diminished. And then D7 flat 9 to G minor 7, and then the A half diminished, that would be... So this is a minor chord, it's a diminished chord, but it's also a minor chord, so you use a minor cadence, so that would be B half diminished to E7 to A half diminished. And this should really help you figure out what's going on in a song. So if we take a look at I Should Care, then we have a secondary cadence to the second degree, so we have here in the second line, E half diminished to D minor 7. Then a little bit later, we have another 2-5 here, because that's, of course, the 2-5 F minor 7 to B flat 7, but it doesn't resolve to E flat major, where it would kind of have to go. So that's not a 2-5, or secondary cadence. Then we have B half diminished E7. It's not resolving to A minor, so that's also not really functioning as a secondary cadence. Then we have G minor 7, C7 to F major. So here we have a secondary cadence to the fourth degree. And then a little bit later, we have a cadence or a secondary 2-5 to the 6th degree to A minor, which is B half diminished, E7 to A minor. And this is really useful for understanding what is going on in the song, but it's also going to give you the ability to take what you learn when you're learning one song to another song where you come across the same type of cadence in another key. So in that way, you kind of have an idea about what it sounds like and what to play on with it. And that's going to make it a lot easier to learn more songs and become a more skilled improviser. Now that we're starting to really work with songs, then the next exercise is going to help you really generalize the information you learn when you analyze a song, but also help you really solve a lot of problems in one go when it comes to harmonizing reharmonizing and making chord melody arrangements. This last exercise makes as much sense to do on the instrument as it does just thinking about what's going on. And it really incorporates not only analyzing the song and the chords, but also really figuring out what the melody is and harmonizing it. And it's going to help you with a lot of things that you really need to work with when you start playing your own chord melody arrangements or coming up with your own version of jazz standards. Here's what you do. Take a song that you know really well and can analyze and move that to another key. So when I'm talking about B 
being able to analyze it, then I mean that you know the chords by heart and you also know which degree in the scale they are, what function of the chord it is, so that it's easier to move it to another key. Because the way I wanted to transpose this is not by just trying to move everything an interval. So I don't want you to think, oh, this is an F minor chord and it needs to move up a major third to A minor. Start to look at what are the different chords in the progression, maybe even think of entire progressions. That's gonna make it a lot faster and a lot easier to have that overview. And then you're really using the theory that you've already been checking out in the previous exercises. So just to give you a short example, that's not an entire song because that takes too long. If we take this progression in C major, So a quick analysis of this is that it's tonic, then we go to the fourth degree and we have the secondary cadence to that, so that's G minor seven, C seven to F major seven. Then we get a four minor six chord, and then we go back to the tonic. Now, if I'm moving this to another key, let's say we're moving it to F major, then we start on the tonic, so that's F. Then I'm going to B flat, so because that's the fourth degree, but I need the cadence for that. So the secondary cadence for B flat is C minor seven, F seven, and then a B flat minor six, and then back to the tonic F major. And the reason for transposing in this way is that it really links what you're doing a lot more to your ear. It's going to help you really predict how something sounds because you may not always in all contexts have an idea about what a B flat major seven sounds like, but you pretty much always will have an idea about what the fourth degree in a major scale sounds like. And that makes this way of thinking and this way of practicing a lot more useful. The next thing you can try to do is to transpose the melody. And this may require you to analyze the song in a way that you probably don't do already. Because I think most of us, we just, we just play the melody. We learn the melody and we don't really think about what notes are in there. But it is actually quite useful to know what notes are in there in terms of what interval is it against the chord and also what is it in the scale because what you will find is that very often in jazz standards we actually tend to harmonize the same notes on the same chords all the time so that is just a nice thing that makes it a lot easier to make chord melody arrangements so if you start working on that and realizing that you're going to have an easier time harmonizing and also reharmonizing a lot of melodies so just to give you an example of how that works let's take a really simple tune like all the things you are so we starting, actually this, the tune starts on the root. So it's in A flat and we start on an A flat, but in the chord, it's the third. And that's another thing that's happening a lot with this song. The third is in the melody most of the time, of the chord at least. So next one, the fourth of the key, but the third of the uh, chord. And then the third in the melody on uh, the dominant. This is actually not that common, hardly if you check standards. Very often they won't use a, a dominant with the third in the melody. Major seven on the tonic chord up to the third. And then again, the third on the fourth degree. So the six of the scale. And this is actually quite common. You will find very often that when it goes to the fourth degree or any kind of subdominant, that's the note you get. And then you get this modulation, which is first the seventh and then the third on the G seven and then really a clear modulation because we get the third on the C major seven. So if I want to use this to play the melody in another key, then I know that I have to start on the root of the key. Uh, so if I want to play it in F, I can just play it here. And then it's of course the sixth chord, that's the first chord. So D minor seven up to G minor to C seven to F major seven, the tonic to B flat major seven to E7 because I'm going to the third degree. And that's of course an A, so I wanna have an A major seven here. And just to give you an example of how you can use this kind of thinking also with reharmonization, in all the things you are, we have, as I said, we have the, the major seven, so the third of the dominant chord in the melody on the dominant. And most of the time when you come across that, or at least very often when you come across that in a song, then that's not harmonized with the dominant. I think probably because they think it's a bit sort of on the obvious side. But um, it's very often harmonized with a sharp four diminished chord and also the reharmonization of that. And in this case, of course, a sharp four diminished chord would be a D half diminished in A flat. You can turn that into a two five, like a D half diminished G seven, and then go to A flat from there. Then you get a reharmonization like this. Which 
which is just a nice change and you don't really have to think about whether it's an E flat 7, you just look at what the melody is and then you know that there are another type of harmony that works really well with that, with that type of melody. Another type of analysis that is really useful for your playing and is also just really good for flexing your music theory muscles is to analyze solo phrases. But I'm not gonna do that in this video because then the video is gonna get way too long. Uh, but maybe that's something I should pick up in another video. Let me know in the comments. As you can tell from this video, I think it's really efficient to learn some music theory. It's going to help you learn faster and become a better improviser. Another thing that a lot of people really want to improve and get better at is to really sound like jazz, to have jazz phrasing and to learn how to improvise jazz melodies. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to start Study bebop. If you want to know more about how and why you should study bebop, then check out this video where I'm covering some of the different things that you will learn and also how you go about studying it.